Hi, this is Pastor McLaren for the Men's Reformed Fellowship, a ministry of First Presbyterian Church in Perkesy, Pennsylvania. We met today on May the uh, 23rd or so, uh, Thursday, May 23rd, and uh, we had a good meeting today, a good discussion. Uh, I, I've been absent for a number of weeks in terms of our videos, and so we are behind on that in terms of covering the topics uh, uh, in Dr. Sproul's book. And there were some very important topics that I've not been able to address on video. We discussed them in our men's group, and I think the Spirit of the Lord was blessing those discussions and uh, hopefully opening some hearts to some different things. Um, so um, I think they are important conversations to have. Um, we were talking about the person and work of Christ, which obviously is at the heart of the Christian faith, so <laughs> it'd be unfortunate if we um, skipped those topics altogether. Um, and I'm kind of uncertain as to how to proceed. I've thought of maybe just doing what we did today. We've started a discussion on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, His person and work, and uh, today we talked about the personal excuse me, the personal nature of the Holy Spirit, which is actually in dispute today and has been throughout the history of the church. Um, so that's an important conversation to have. Um, and the last time we also spoke about the deity of the Holy Spirit, how the Spirit is God, uh, the third member of the Holy Trinity. Uh, so obviously some very important conversations there as well. So we have a lot to make up uh, in a brief period of time. And uh, I think what I will try to do, and this might not work too well, but I'll try to recover some of the important topics that we considered on the person and work of Christ, uh, in particular uh, a discussion of his ascension, his role as our mediator, his three office three offices of prophet, priest, and king. Uh, these are all very important topics that are neglected in many respects in the Christian church today. Um, one could say that doctrine as a whole is neglected in the Christian church today. Um, there's more an emphasis on experience and feelings and um, very basics to the Christian faith. Um, and certainly the Christian faith is uh, an experience. It's a, it has an impact on our feelings. Um, and there are certain basics of the Christian faith that everyone needs to know. Uh, but also we want to grow and make progress and move towards maturity in our faith. And that demands that we think about God's revelation of himself in Scripture. And we develop our understanding of uh, things uh, and, and the benefit of that is not just that we can have some new ideas, but uh, that that will strengthen our faith in Jesus Christ, strengthen our faith in the Word of God, and that will pay huge dividends uh, in the course of life as we face many trials and tests in the course of life of all sorts and manners and temptations, of course, as well. Um, with all these things coming our way, uh, what a blessing it will be to have a, a well-rounded, well-grounded faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so um, these things are very important. Um, so let me uh, just try to briefly touch on some things on the uh, person and work of Christ, particularly now his, his work, his offices, and his uh, uh, ascension into heaven. And then maybe I can either pick up the work on the Holy Spirit in uh, the next video or uh, we'll see how we do uh, this morning. Um, but, and I shouldn't be doing this because I haven't reviewed this since uh, we considered it. Um, but um, the chapters that we will look at this morning include chapters 32 through, well, it could be 36, and uh, the, these discuss the glory of Christ, chapter 32, the ascension of Christ, 
Jesus Christ as mediator, chapter 34, 35, the threefold office of Christ, and 36, the titles of Christ, which all are uh, important uh, conversations. Um, I think I want to first highlight the ascension of Christ in part because we are at that time of year in the Christian calendar where we remember the ascension of Christ. You recall that following his resurrection, which to locate that on your calendars, Easter Sunday, um, following his resurrection, he had uh, many appearances to his disciples over a course of 40 days. So he met with uh, the disciples in the upper room on a couple of occasions. Uh, he met with some on the road. Uh, and uh, then finally, there are meetings of Christ with a great crowd in Galilee on one of the mountains there. And then even uh, a meeting with um, Peter and a couple of the other disciples as they were out fishing on the boat in Galilee. So you have these multiple appearances of Jesus uh, following his resurrection, and so he is in a glorified body, but it's not, it's kind of a temporary arrangement uh, which awaits his ascension and glorification in heaven. Uh, you recall that Jesus said to, I think it was Martha who was clinging to him, that uh, he has not yet ascended to my God and to your God, and so there was a sense that. Uh, at the very start, that this was a, a kind of temporary period of time and that his appearances to his disciples were perhaps more for the purpose of confirming the resurrection, assuring them of his uh, commitments to them and uh, the, the benefits of his work on the cross. Remember, he said, peace be with you. Um, and then um, preparing them for his ascension into heaven and heavenly glory. So the ascension is a, a, a doctrine which is largely neglected and rarely appreciated in the Christian church today. I'm talking about in general. Uh, many times we have the sense that Jesus really is kind of absent. He's up there in the heavens somewhere and we don't quite know what he's doing, perhaps other than perhaps he intercedes for us in prayer and is working to save us and that much is all well and good. Um, but the ascension of Christ is his enthronement in heaven. It is his ascension to the heavenly city of Jerusalem, to the uh, celestial temple, uh, where he enters into the very presence of God, the Creator, the Father. And there he sits down at the Father's right side. That's uh, uh, anthropomorphic language uh, to describe his authority, his power, his uh, glorification. Uh, his presence with the Father. And from that position, enthroned in glory, in a human body in glory, that body is in glory, um, Jesus rules over the heavens and the earth, and he is organizing all things for the purpose of his elect, for his church. And so he rules over the nations of the earth even now. Uh, throughout the history from his ascension in that first century, uh, to this very day, Jesus rules over all things for the good of his church from heaven above. Um, in, in a Reformed perspective, as opposed to a Lutheran perspective, the human body of Jesus remains uh, in its integrity. It remains in its finitude. It's glorified. It, it does much more than what a normal human body will do here but it's still a human body and it does not take on divine attributes such as uh, everywhere present. The Spirit, the, the, the Son of God, uh, the eternal second member of the Trinity is an eternal uh, omniscient Spirit. And so the Spirit of the Son is present everywhere, but the humanity of Jesus is located in one place in glory uh, beside the Father in heaven. So um, we, in the Reformed camp, stress uh, the continuing abiding human nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's uh, very important to us today on a variety of levels, uh, one of which is the affirmation on God's part that our physical bodies are important to God. 
It's not as though, um, you know, in a, in a Gnostic fashion, the body is just a temporary thing, an evil thing, and it really needs to fall away, and we need to ascend to become a pure spirit. And really, the future for the church is as a pure spirit. Um, that's not the case. Jesus rose from the dead with his human body, and he ascended into heaven with that very same human body, glorified, majestic, exalted, but still human. Uh, you remember that when Jesus met with his disciples, he showed Thomas his hands and his side, indicating that this is still my real body, the body that was crucified on the cross. It still bears the scars and marks of that crucifixion. Um, you recall as well, Jesus meets with Peter and I believe John and perhaps a couple of the other disciples in John 21, where he uh, sits down with them and has a meal, uh, eats fish. So it's a real human body that Jesus displayed in his resurrection. It's that body that's in heaven as well. So our bodies will rise from the dead like Christ. We are joined to him and our bodies will rise from the ground, uh, be reconstituted as glorified bodies, but remain intact as our personal human body. And we will live forever in that glorified body with the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, th there is first that uh, assurance that we will rise uh, in body and in soul, just as Jesus also rose from the dead. That's a great comfort to us. Um, we might look at our bodies and think, well, there are certain things that I'd like to improve about my body. Uh, we're not all going to look, I'm sure, like Rock Hudson or Elvis Presley in terms of being very handsome men or uh, you pick your favorite movie star woman to be the ideal beautiful picture of a woman. That's not the case, but we will be who we are glorified, and it will be a beautiful thing, uh, just as we are. So uh, that uh, we have to wait for. And then secondly, the ascension of the human body of Jesus has an impact on our understanding of the Lord's Supper. And this distinguishes the Reformed faith from Roman Catholicism and Lutheranism, uh, which both uh, undermine the humanity of Jesus by saying that that humanity is present uh, in the communion meal. The Roman church says that the bread and wine are transformed into the very body and blood of Jesus. So when the priest uh, breaks the bread in front of his congregants in a Roman Catholic church, he is re-sacrificing the very body of Jesus. Think of that for a moment. And so when he gives you that bread, he is effectively saying, I am giving you a portion of the very flesh of Christ, the body of Christ. This is for you. And should you drink of the cup, you're drinking his blood in the Roman Catholic tradition. Um, in John 6, when Jesus talked about uh, eating his flesh and drinking his blood, it's apparent that he, he was speaking metaphorically, spiritually, not literally. Clearly his body, his flesh and blood were right there before them and he wasn't saying, eat this. Um, so he was speaking metaphorically, spiritually. And so the communion meal is not a literal eating of the bread, the, the, excuse me, the body or blood of Christ. It's a metaphor. It's a spiritual um, participation in the body and blood of Christ. And so the Romanist has the, the body or the bread and the cup transformed into the very body of Christ. The Lutheran does something a little bit similar, but they, they try to avoid the more, if you will, I think Luther's term was magical elements of the Roman Catholic conception, transfigure, transformation of the, the elements. For the Lutheran, the body of Christ is in, with, and under the elements of the bread and cup. So the body takes on these um, divine attributes, at least uh, among some, at least of the Lutheran. I think the majority of the Lutheran position is in this way, at least it had been. The body of Christ is in, with, and under the elements. 
not to be identified with the elements, but is present there. And that, uh, likewise, is problematic for our understanding of the human nature of Christ because now it takes on divine attributes, being everywhere present. And so when the communion is served in Lutheran churches throughout the United States and in Germany and wherever else they are in the world, then similarly in the Roman Catholic uh, churches throughout Italy and South America and the United States and elsewhere around the world, France, Spain, what have you, the body of Jesus is present in each of those different locations and being broken in each of those different locations, sacrificed repeatedly over and over and over and over, and over again in the Roman church. Uh, and this is disastrous from many perspectives uh, in that it undermines the once for all nature of the death of Christ. He died once to atone for sin. There's no more sacrifice of the body of Jesus. It was done once at the cross. And the effect of that one offering for sin is that he is forever able to take away all of our sins. So there does not need to be multiple re-sacrificings of the body of Christ. We are not in the old covenant period of time where the lambs were offered on the altars uh, Sabbath to Sabbath, day by day, um, to atone for the sins of the people. No, Jesus fulfilled that, those multiple offerings by his once-for-all offering of himself at the cross. So the Roman church uh, undermines the once-for-all sacrifice of Christ. It diminishes its effectiveness and says that there needs to be multiple sacrifices for sin within the Roman church through the participation of the mass. Um, that is destructive of our salvation. Um, and it's idolatrous as well uh, in elevating the bread and cup into the very divine body and blood of Christ uh, in the Roman conception. So um, the, the Roman church is idolatrous, sacrilegious, blasphemous. Um, the, the offering of the mass it is an abuse of the body of Christ uh, and it's destructive and harmful to the believer. It undermines their faith in the once for all uh, virtue of Christ's death. Um, both the Lutheran and the Roman church conception also undermines the humanity of Jesus. Jesus really effectively is no longer human. He is assumed into the divine because his human body now has divine attributes no longer a finite body but is everywhere present is omniscient it all these kinds of things are now attached to the human body of Jesus so we lose our savior under those conceptions we lose the Jesus who is exalted into heaven uh, for us and stands there for us, for our humanity. Um, and the, the movement of the, the Christian faith is not taking us as humans and making us divine. It's simply we remain divine, or excuse me, we remain human in this life and in the next. We are glorified, we are divinized in the sense that we reflect God's perfect character in ourselves but we remain finite human creatures of God. We do not take on divine uh, attributes such as being present everywhere and almighty, um, infinite, these kinds of things. So um, the, the Roman and Lutheran positions um, violate the, the direction of, of Christian faith which does not move us, and this is very much like uh, modernist, uh, pantheist uh, forms of thinking or Gnostic forms of thinking. It doesn't move us from the human to the divine and take becoming gods. We don't become gods. We remain human at every stage of our existence. So, um, you know, isn't that, isn't that the temptation that Satan gave to Adam and Eve in the garden, you shall be as gods, knowing good from evil. Isn't that the root of all of our sin? An attempt to become like God? 
Um, <coughs> so the ascension of Christ is uh, very important. We need to understand that in terms of his integrity, the integrity of his person. Its application for us is multiform. Um, the other one aspect of it is in terms of uh, eschatology. And here you have groups such as the dispensationalists or um, with their premillennial position or the Christian reconstructionist with his postmillennial position, which both uh, argue for uh, the rule of Christ in history and time uh, in the future. So that with the dispensational premillennial position, uh, there is the sense that um, Christ must come down from heaven and establish his millennial reign on the earth for a thousand year period of time. And so that's when the reign of Christ occurs on earth. And we don't need to get into the details of that, just to note that that's the perception, that the reign of Christ on earth really begins with that millennial kingdom, a thousand year period of time in which Christ reigns on the earth. The Christian reconstructionist point of view, or theonomist point of view, uh, which embraces uh, a, a post-millennial eschatology. Not all theonomists are post-millennial, by the way. Some are amillennial. But in, in a, a post-millennial uh, point of view, uh, the, the kingdom of God uh, arises out of the Christian church over time as it, the gospel progresses uh, across the earth and people are converted, and then you have a golden age on the earth for a thousand years or for an extended period of time, if you take that more uh, symbolically. Uh, but at any rate, this is when Jesus effectively rules on the earth with victory over the nations, and that's when his purpose is accomplished. Um, both, I think, undermine our faith in the ascension of Christ upon uh, or immediately following upon his resurrection from the dead. He ascended in full view of the disciples into heaven, and there he was seated at the Father's right hand, enthroned in heaven. And he is Lord of lords, King of kings. He rules over the heavens and the earth. He organizes all things uh, for the good of the church. Read the end of Ephesians chapter 1. He is uh, seated in the heavens, and all the nations are uh, to be the footstool for his feet. And he has a name that is above every name. Um, so uh, Jesus Christ is currently ruling over all things and accomplishing his perfect will. In fact, he has bound Satan with his death on the cross and now plunders his kingdom as the gospel goes throughout the nations of the earth and God's elect are gathered into the church. Jesus Christ is coordinating all that, if you will, ruling that, ordaining that from heaven itself. He is our king. And so uh, the, the victory of the Lord Jesus in space and time history is already ongoing. It does not await some millennial period yet to come. It is happening now as Jesus rescues his church from sin and Satan and brings them uh, into fellowship with himself. That is the true, meaningful victory of Christ over the forces of evil. This is where Christ is victorious. Jesus said to his disciples uh, to take heart. He has overcome the world. Uh, by his resurrection, by his ascension, he has triumphed over sin and death. And he rules over all now. The dispensationalists with their premillennial vision, they uh, um, Reconstructionists with their post-millennial uh, vision of history undermined faith in the present lordship of Christ over all. And I would say they distort really what our perception of the future life on this earth will be uh, in different ways, but nonetheless they distort that. Um, Christ is accomplishing his mission in history and time now in the gathering of his people out of the nations of the earth to be his people in eternity to come. And there are uh, ramifications of that for all of life, but really in the end, uh, Christ is rescuing his people. We are strangers and sojourners in this world, and we are awaiting for the coming new heavens and the new earth where we will reign with Christ for 
uh, and eternity, uh, reigning being defined as uh, living in obedience to God uh, in heart, mind, and soul in every way. So that briefly <laughs> is the ascension of Christ, and we can consider as well uh, the mediatorial role of Christ, um, and, and in part we, we've done that. The one thing I'd like to uh, highlight here with regard to the mediatorial role of Jesus is first the fact that he alone is uh, the, the mediator between God and men. There are not multiple mediators. Uh, the Apostle Paul is very explicit about that. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You can read about that in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Um, so the, there is one mediator provided for us, one who uh, stands between God and us. There is a, a uh, condition of enmity and hostility between God and us, which is something that um, Satan blinds us to. He assures us that everything is okay. We're okay with God. God's okay with us. God loves us. We love God. Uh, we're all on uh, good terms. And so Satan obfuscates the real position of the human heart, which is uh, at root hostile to God and uh, intends to rebel against God in every uh, portion of life wherever uh, there is a challenge between what God's will is and our will is. Uh, the human heart is in rebellion against God. And so, uh, and God, by his justice, must punish these rebels and uh, judge them for their uh, sin, their rebellion. And, uh, and so you have a situation of hostility between God and men existing in this world. How is this remedied? Well, it's not going to be remedied from the human side because we are committed to hostility, committed to rebellion. Our minds are blinded to our circumstances. Satan further uh, deceives and deludes people so that they don't understand uh, the danger in which they're in or the real circumstances in which they're in. And so uh, the, the natural man uh, is in a position where he will never arise out of his, his state of rebellion and hostility and move towards reconciliation with God. He is incapable of doing that. He is enslaved to his sinful nature. Paul says we are even dead in our transgressions and sins. Um, so there's no way that we on our own are going to manufacture a way back to God or seek for God, arise out of our fleshly darkness into a, a realm of light and evolve into a God, that is just uh, nonsense from a biblical point of view. And so what we need is someone to bring two sides together, to reconcile them, to bring peace between God and men. And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. He is the one mediator who alone is uniquely qualified to bring reconciliation between God and his creatures, between God and his church. Now, Christ stands merely for those who are given to his care, to his charge, and these are the elect, those whom God has chosen in eternity past and given over to the Son. They are his responsibility. He represents them. He doesn't represent everyone in the world, just those who are entrusted to his care. He stands for them. He answers for them. He pays the debt of their sin. He suffers the wrath of God for their sin by taking on their human body, taking on our human nature in a sinless manner, but nonetheless becoming our substitute, going to the cross, paying the full penalty for our sins, and uh, reconciling us to God. Uh, so Jesus is uniquely qualified for this. He has a perfect human uh, nature, and in that human nature, he suffers for our sins and reconciles us with God. And he is also uh, the divine second member of the Trinity, the Son of God, who empowers the death of Christ in such a way that he atones not only for one person's sins, but for the sins of all those who are united to him through faith. So we have in Jesus 
uh, the one mediator who truly loves us, truly understands us, who has given his life for us, for our redemption, so that we might be reconciled to God. And he truly knows the Father. He knows the Father intimately from eternity and is able to reveal the Father to us. So he alone is unique in his ability to mediate between us and God. Now, that speaks against, again, the Roman Catholic conception, which has multiple mediators in the heavenlies. You have various saints who have gone on before the church and the Roman Catholic Church, the priest, uh, encourages people to make prayers to St. Peter, to St. Jude, to St. this, St. that, and all kinds, St. Christopher. We, we pray to all these different saints. Maybe we pray to departed loved ones as well who we think have gone, gone to heaven or what have you. But at any rate, we seek their help for different areas of life. Isn't that just what the pagans do in their multiple gods who have certain areas where they are responsible for? So St. Jude might be the, the, the saint to appeal to for safety in traveling and St. Christopher for safety and this or that or all different kinds of things. That's a pagan conception. It is the application of, of uh, the, the language of Christianity uh, to really a pagan experience and trying to syncretize the two. So obviously that's a very dangerous thing. And it's foolish because Saints Peter and Paul and Jude and Christopher and all the rest of them, they are, are human. Uh, they don't become gods, right? So how can uh, Jude or Christopher or whoever uh, hear all of the many prayers that are addressed to them? How can they respond to them in any meaningful way um, without having divine attributes? Um, that's quite a problem. And then the, the Roman sa Romanist says, um, we have the Virgin Mary, who really in the modern Roman Catholic Church has become a co-redeemer with Christ. Um, Jesus was immaculately conceived Mary was immaculately conceived. Jesus lived a sinless, holy life. Mary lived a sinless, holy life. Um, Mary did not have other sexual relations. She had no other children. Her virginity is a perpetual virginity. This feeds into the idea that Mary is sinless because the Roman church kind of feels like sex is an evil, corrupt thing in and of itself, just by the very nature of what it is. And so Mary is a perpetual virgin uh, and remains sinless. Jesus suffers at the cross for our sins. Mary similarly suffers at the cross as she sees her son uh, suffer and die. Jesus rises from the dead and ascends into heaven. Mary is a, has her day of assumption where she ascends into the heavens. Jesus reigns in the heavens. Mary reigns in the heavens. We pray to Jesus, at least we should if we're Roman Catholic, but we pray to Mary. And even in, in this, the Roman church says, the priest says, pray to Mary because she is the mother of Jesus and she is compassionate. She is more sympathetic to us. She is of a kind heart. And so we should bring our requests to Mary because uh, we are more likely to have a favorable answer. She can then intercede for us with Jesus and she can intercede with the Father and these kinds of things. Now, that is uh, idolatrous. That is uh, a sinful response to Jesus. If Jesus loved us so much to die for us, how can one say that Mary is more sympathetic, more kind, and more compassionate than Jesus? Mary didn't die on the cross for us. Mary didn't uh, pay the penalty for our sins by her death on the cross. Uh, that's what Jesus did for us. And to suggest that the Virgin Mary is more compassionate than Jesus is quite an offensive statement to make. And once more, we are challenged with the thought that Mary in the Roman conception really becomes divine. She has to have divine attributes if she's going to hear the millions of Roman Catholics uh, throughout every continent on earth crying out to her for help and intercession. Well, how does one human interact with all of this? 
she would have to have divine attributes, um, omniscience, omnipresence, um, omnipotence, in, in being able to effect some miracle or some uh, uh, work of change in our lives. So um, th there's a, a real problem with Mary as a mediator. And again, we come back to what the scripture says. Um, Jesus is the one mediator for the church. We don't need anybody else. Now, the Roman church says, well, the scriptures teach us to pray for one another, and so why don't we have the saints in heaven praying for us as well? Well, the scriptures never encourage us to pray to those who have passed on, to those who are dead. There's no communication between us and them. The only one who can hear us is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's why we pray to him. The rest of the saints, they can't hear us. They don't know what's going on. Um, they are in heaven, and they're waiting for the glory of Christ to be revealed uh, when he returns. But um, the, the Roman church is really misleading its followers by uh, diminishing the work of Christ as our uh, only mediator. We should go through Jesus and nobody else. It is an offense to go to anybody else but Jesus. And um, we are to pray for one another here in this life and intercede for one another, but we don't have those who pass on before us go into glory uh, interceding for us because they cannot hear our prayers. It, it, it's just, they're not divine. They're human. They can't hear you. I can't hear somebody's outside of this room. They can't hear anybody. I'm sure their hearing is better than mine, but they're not hearing you here on earth. So that is uh, the, the mediatorial office of Christ in brief. Um, and finally, I think for today, the threefold offices of Christ. Um, the threefold office of Christ. This is talking about Christ's mediatorial role and how that kind of works itself out. And in the scriptures, um, there are three offices or three aspects of the one mediatorial office that Jesus holds in himself, which is unique in our, uh, God's revelation. Um, he holds the office of prophet, priest, and king. Uh, as the prophet of the church, he speaks for God to us. He reveals the nature and will of God for us. And so uh, he is the one who is the source of the word of God in this world today. Uh, he is the prophet of the church. He is the priest in that he's the one who brings us before God. He reconciles us. He prays for us. Um, he brings peace between God and us. He is the priest. And so he pleads the benefits of his death on the cross for us there in heaven. And so he is our great high priest. We don't have a priest on earth earth as again you have in the Roman church and in I, I think in the Lutheran church as well maybe the Episcopalian and uh, Anglican church you have priests in these communions um, that is uh, not given in scripture there, there's not a continuing uh, office of the priesthood in the church of the Lord Jesus in this age remember when Paul speaks of the gifts that Christ gave to the church in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, apostles and prophets, uh, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. That's who he mentions. He doesn't say priests. One would think he would have said something about priests in the church. No mention of that. In his uh, uh, address to various churches under his charge, he doesn't speak to uh, the priest in any particular congregation. He doesn't call Timothy a priest. Um, there's nothing about a priesthood uh, as an office within the church. There is the general priesthood of believers in that we are all responsible to pray for one another and, and worship the Lord as part of our uh, individual calling. Uh, and, and you could say that we all have a sense of the office of prophet, not that we um, reveal God in an inspired way, but we do uh, encourage one another and teach each other from the word of God. And so we have a, a kind of prophetic role within the life of our, our, our families and within the life of the church. Now, pastors and teachers exercise something of that prophetic gift, but it's an uninspired, if you will, reconstructive gift 
that builds on the revelation that we already have from Jesus Christ. They don't add to that revelation in any way at all. We develop it, we understand it more deeply, hopefully, and we explain how it applies to a wide variety of aspects of life, but that revelation comes to us through Jesus Christ. And then finally, Jesus Christ is the king of the church. He rules from heaven over the earth, and I've mentioned this with regard to his ascension. Uh, we similarly are called to reign in life with Christ. We are to overcome sin and Satan, and we are to uh, live lives of obedience to the Lord Jesus. So we are to have dominion in life, uh, which is defined as not becoming culturally dominant so much as that we be personally obedient to the Lord Jesus, living the resurrection life in this world. And that may mean that, as the Apostle Paul said, uh, he who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's not the dominant lifestyle in terms of worldly thinking, where we are dominant culturally over all things and exercise that dominion in many ways. I think we should work towards that and, and seek to influence our culture in ways uh, that lead to obedience to Christ and a reflection of his rules and standards in the world. That's to the blessing and stability of the church. But what's important is that we overcome sin and Satan in our lives and so reign with Christ in glory. You can read more about that in Romans chapter 6. So Jesus is uh, our, our uh, great high priest. He is our king and he is our prophet. And so he holds these off this one office in this threefold aspect, both in his earthly ministry prior to his cross and resurrection, and then certainly in heaven above as well. Uh, that is his mediatorial role in the life of the church. Um, I, I'll just, I think I want to backtrack just briefly one moment to uh, this idea of Christ as our mediator to whom we pray um, and ask this question of my Roman Catholic friends. If Jesus is the eternal Son of God who takes on our humanity to die for us and who ascends into heaven uh, as uh, the perfect, glorious Savior from sin, and if he is appointed in the church as the great high priest of the church, uh, one who is sympathetic to us, who understands everything about us, why would you go to any other mediator? Why is there any need to consult with Mary or the saints? You have everything you need in Jesus Christ. You have uh, the one who loves you more intensely, more perfectly than Mary or the saints ever could. Why go to them? Jesus encourages you in the, in, in, in the Gospel of John as we're making our way through to, to come to him and what you ask, he will give to you. Everything you ask me, I will give to you, he says to his disciples in John chapters 13 through 17. He is one who prays for us. There's no need for any other mediator. Um, there's no need for the Virgin Mary or the saints to intercede for us. We have Jesus for that. Why go to anyone less? Um, just from our discussion this morning, I emphasize the fact that we have communion with God, immediate communion with God, and so we enter immediately into, into the very presence of the Father in prayer, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. And so there is no need whatsoever for anybody else. We are in fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit through Christ the Mediator. Who needs Mary and the saints for anything? They themselves need Christ as their mediator to bring them into the presence of God along with us. We all stand together in this one church of the Lord Jesus Christ that has access to the Father through the Son and by the Holy Spirit, not through each other but through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. And so we have a complete, full, and perfect redemption that is complete from beginning to end. And so let's go to Jesus. Go to the Father through Jesus, who alone is the mediator between God and men. 
Well, we'll pick this up again next time, Lord willing, and make our way through uh, or into the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So may God bless you through his Son, the Lord Jesus. May his Spirit strengthen you to receive his word in faith. Uh, may you act on the word of Christ and obey him by leaving a Roman church that misleads many and is destructive to the human soul by its false religion. I'm, I know I'm being very provocative and strong there in that language, but that's the way it is. Uh, I'm not saying that all Roman Catholics are, are not Christian by any means. There are many who do not accept those different aspects of what they hear in the church or don't pay any attention to that and they just have a simple faith in Christ. I'm not saying you can't be a believer in Christ or saved and be within the Roman Catholic Church, but I would say that obedience to Christ means that you leave those churches and attend a Reformed church that is more faithful, more obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and his revealed will for you. Um, that's all a part of our sanctification. We need to pursue holiness, righteousness, godliness through Christ in obedience to his word. Well, I would encourage you, if you're in the area in Upper Bucks or Montgomery counties, um, please come and join us at First Presbyterian Church. We're located in Perkesey in the main uh, road through town on Fifth Street. Uh, we are across from the firehouse uh, to give you a bit of a landmark there. Uh, our, our church is a small red brick building on the corner of Fifth and Race Street. So if you think about McLaren, think about Race Street. Uh, McLaren Racing Team. Uh, it is a little bit of my personal history, not that I have involved in it. But um, come and join us. We meet at 9.30 in the morning for worship. Please arrive by about 9.15. Get settled in your pew and uh, meditate on God's Word, pray, and uh, be ready to receive God's Word. And uh, we have a blessed time of fellowship. We have a wonderful group of people here. And uh, we are reaching out to others that they too might come to Christ and join with us in worshiping him. Worship is a wonderful, wonderful experience, being in the presence of God. I hope you'll join us for that this Sunday and every Sunday as long as we're here in this world. God bless you. Take care. Bye.